Michael Harris, welcome to Mastering You with Matt Sutton. Great to have you today. How are we? I'm doing really good. I, I got up early this morning. I live next to a river and went walking down, hiking down the trail this morning before I did anything. So oh, it's wow. a good I day. like it. I like it. You're taking this podcast seriously. That's it. Getting, <laughs> getting in the zone. Where, whereabouts in the world are you, Michael? I live in a town called Bend, Oregon. It's central Oregon. We're at about 3,700 feet. It's high desert and right up against the east slope of the Cascades. Wow. It sounds amazing. It's a beautiful place. And, you know, one of the things I talked about hiking this morning along the river, I have a goal this year and I'm a little bit ahead that I'm either going to climb a ridge or a butte once a week, every week. So get on top of something once a week. And that really keeps my heart going. And, you know, just the whole mindset of getting to the top of the mountain. Yeah, it's so important to have to have those little goals that mean something to you, doesn't it? Absolutely, especially for me. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about mindset today. Um, and one of the things that you help people do is um, teach people how to take quantum leaps in their life, right? Absolutely. One of the things that, that I've recognized over the years, uh, Matt, and to, in, to anybody that, that's listening as well is, you know, I'm a fitness guy in a different way, which maybe we'll, we'll get into a little bit, but been doing yoga for 30 plus years and such. And I found that when I take a look at the world, quantum leaps are happening all the time. Quantum leap is, is essentially a change of state from one state to another. You could even call blushing a quantum leap. It's a change of state from mm -hmm. one state to another and it happens instantly. And I don't know about where, where you are, but where I live, I can be standing up in the mountains somewhere. It can be perfectly blue sky. And within 10 seconds, it can be a heavy snowfall. Again, a change of state from one oh, yeah, state. Oh yeah, 100%. Well, I live in the another. UK, so it can go from yeah. <laughs> snowing to sun in half yeah, an hour. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> back and forth, you know, a couple of times in minutes, right? So I started looking at that. I remember the time where I was standing in the middle of this mud flats up, up in the mountains and that happening. And I thought, oh, this is a quantum leap. What if we could engineer our own quantum leaps? Because somebody engineered that instant snowfall somehow along the way, some consciousness did. And what if we could do that in our own lives? What if we could change our mind? What if we could do something in our lives to change our lives from one state to the other. Is that what your, I, is that what your definition of a quantum leap is, to, to change from one state to another? Well, that, that is the, the definition. That is, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. it's a powerful, powerful idea. When yeah, did you first absolutely. start to think about this the, the, and take it seriously? Because I suppose it's one of those things that everyone kind of, hears and I guess in personal development like a lot of things it almost becomes something that you, you know about but don't take too seriously and I think that's probably the issue with a lot of personal development is that there's a re reason why there are certain sayings there, there are certain ideas because that there's some truth and some power behind them but because people hear them so often it's kind of there's not that belief that it can actually work for them well, you, you know, they say test all our beliefs, right? And, you know, let, let's take another example. You've got what's called the law of attraction, right? You know, the, the book, The Secret, made that really popular, that idea of the law of attraction. And lots of people threw rocks at it, you know, at that book and that idea, because they didn't think that the concept was real. You know, my, with, this is another rabbit hole. My brother actually helped Rhonda Byrne put that book together. Wow. Right? The, the Secret, but the Law of Attraction, you know, you, you think Aunt Mabel's, you know, if you sit on your couch long enough, Aunt Mabel's going to drop 10 million bucks on you, you know, your rich aunt. But it's not going to happen. Mm. So John Asaraf, which was um, some, some of the listeners may have heard of him. He was also part of The Secret. And, mm. um, and he came in, he came up with the idea of the law of Goya. Well, the law of Goya, G-O-Y-A, is get off your ass. 
So you actually got to take the action to make the attraction happen. You can't just sit there and wish it. Yeah, the law of attraction is almost like a, a marketing. It's a great marketing label. Three words sounds very enticing. Um, but but ultimately, it's like a, a marketing label for that, isn't it? Get off your ass. Right. And it, it's actually something that, that we all do. And I'll teach more about the, the some of the ideas in a, in a workshop uh, type environment. One of the things, again, I'm an observer. I like to see things. I, I like to connect dots. And one of the things that I realized about this whole mindset thing, we're doing it all the time anyway. And let, let, let me ask you, I, I don't know what, what you eat, so I'm going to make this up a little bit. But, you know, maybe you're, you think about, well, I'm going to have um, this great steak. I'm going to have a potato with it. I'm going to get broccoli. I'm going to, you know, what, whatever it might be that you have on that plate. And you can sit at home and go, oh, wow, you know, this is what I want for dinner. But you know what? You don't have any of that stuff in your refrigerator. So you got to go down to the store, you got to get the steak, the potato, the broccoli, the salad, whatever it might be that, that you're, that you're going to make. You come home, you put that together, and then, whoa well and lo, well and lo, it's on a plate at your dining room table, and you have just manifested what you had thought about a couple of hours on your head, right? Yeah. Right. So we're yeah. manifesting things yeah. all the time, but we're just not connecting those dots. So if we're doing that all the time, why not do that in, in other areas? And to take that a step further, you, you get people that might overhear someone talking or they'll read something in a magazine and they'll see someone eating that same meal. And maybe they've learned that that's good for them or it helps them lose weight. And and then they take that idea and it sits in their unconscious mind for the whole week until they feel like, oh, I've got time to go to the butchers and get that steak. And like you say, suddenly it's on your plate on Saturday night within seven days of the idea coming about. Yep. I guess what you're saying is what's the difference between that and bigger ideas, bigger thoughts? I don't, no think, there is right? any, I don't think there is any difference. No. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. Know, yeah. The listeners can't see this, but I can see this. Behind you, you have pictures of people going from one state to another, their fitness. Maybe they're a little overweight and they, they lose some weight. You know, that imagery is really good. You know, when we start a fitness practice, there's a reason that we want to do it because we want to get, we want to slim down, we want to get stronger, we want to have more endurance, what, what, whatever the aspects are that we want. And we can picture ourselves like that. So again, the pictures that you have there behind you are prime example of when somebody else comes in and goes, I want to look like that guy. I want to look like that woman. I want to feel like that. I want to feel like what she looks like. Right? Exactly. So that imagery yeah. is helping us, just like you said mm -hmm. a moment ago you know, maybe a week down the road, maybe a month down the road, maybe it takes a couple of months to get there. But that law of attraction, that vision, that mindset, whatever you want to call it, is helping us create whatever it is we want. Yeah, amazing. So um, talking about quantum leaps, particularly in health, um, you, you quickly shared before we started the episode about your own I don't know whether you'd class it as a quantum leap, but you certainly took a mindset shift with your own health many years ago. And um, this forms part of your own story to sort of where you are today. Do you mind just sort of sharing that a little bit with the listeners? Yeah, let me give you a little um, backstory to it, a little bit more than, than what we talked about. When I was 12 years old, I was a hot shot water skier. And I was water skiing one day and I hit the beach, I was doing a beach landing, I went too fast and uh, got bruised up and banged up. But, you know, the next day I was in the hospital. Two weeks later, I, I woke up and I found out they had removed 60% of my liver, my gallbladder, cracked ribs, collapsed lung, wow. coma for 10 days or so, you know, died and came back and all that How stuff. How old are you at this point, Michael? 12. Wow. Okay. 
So I, I was pretty beat up. I was the kid in school that looked sick all the time. You know, I started seventh grade in January in January rather than September, just because my healing, but I still had a tube in the side of me uh, for a while. And again, I'm kind of making a longer story, compressing a little bit. I started getting really poor self-esteem. I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't think the girls liked me, none of that stuff. And so started smoking too much pot as a, as a kid, started drinking, went through all that and then fast forward up to the time where I was 27, I ended up at the vascular department of OHSU, Oregon Health Sciences University, and them telling me that my right leg was 100% blocked and my left leg, the popliteal artery in, in each of my legs were blocked. Wow. And cholesterol was 140, all my HDL, all my blood panels were normal, yet I presented with these blockages. So. They did what's called a fempop, which is essentially a bypass surgery in the legs. And a few months later, they wanted to do it again because it had reblocked again. And I said no, and I, I left the hospital AMA against medical advice. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know anything, really much of anything at that time. And this is where the mindset really shifted. I, I ended up at a place called the Pritikin Longevity Center in Santa Monica, California. It's along the boardwalk between Santa Monica and Marina Del Rey, Venice Beach is in there and, and all that. And I was walking on a cane at the time, you know, using my cane to walk, I could barely walk. And the doctors at OHSU in Portland, you know, basically said, don't walk, it hurts too much, you need more surgery, all of this. The doctor at the Pritikin Center said, put down your cane, get up and walk as much as you possibly can. And it's like he gave me permission to get healthy again, right? And he said, as you walk, you are going to be in pain. But that pain is going to trigger a process in your body that's going to build new blood vessels in your legs. And as you begin that walking process, you're going to be able to walk further and further. Now, Matt, granted, here I am on the boardwalk, Southern California, Santa Monica. And there's also a lot of nice looking women on rollerblades. And I have to admit, I didn't want to be the 97 pound weakling going up and down that boardwalk. So I stood tall. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept walking up and down the, the boardwalk. And within two weeks, I was walking two miles. Wow. Two weeks. What, what, kind of age, what age were you in your teens at this point or in your 20s? Uh, 27. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. So this, this, this whole accident started just 12 years old and you were really sort of struggling with the after effects for a good 15 years? Well... Was it they don't they, they didn't relate the vascular disease to my accident right okay yeah so they, it was like two different things whether or not there were some underlying thing and they were related nobody knows mm. yeah and and so what what triggered then like when you say you had like a bit of a mindset shift what what, what how could you describe that well just the permission that that doctor gave me you know, because all the other doctors, you know, the white coats, you know, they can be scary. Oh, you got this terrible thing going on. If you don't yeah. do this, you're going to die. Yeah. Or we're going to cut your legs off. And this guy said, you don't got that much wrong with you. Just get up and walk. Start moving your body. Mm. You will feel better. So this set of doctors was giving me one mindset. This set of this set of doctor, not even a set of doctors, this doctor said, just get up and walk. And what and were I the key lessons that you really took from that experience? Oh, there, there's so many. I ended up writing a book about it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the name of the book. Uh, Falling Down, Getting Up. Good yeah, title. <laughs> yeah, it's actually the 10-year anniversary 
in July and we're going to do another book launch with it. Um, my publisher and I, but um, yeah, you know, what I found for, for me, Matt, is that, you know, getting healthy, staying fit, having a good mind is not as difficult as what everybody makes it out to be. You know, the, there's all this complicated ideas about what to do. Mm, yeah. Or again, this doctor just said, get up and walk. Yeah. Move yeah. And, and then body. what was talked about way too much in my eyes is just how hard things are. Oh, it's so hard to do. It's so hard to do that. But as you know, from what you've been through, it's much, much harder to suffer every day with with mindset or emotional you know and physical like you know, if you physically can't walk and so so if you are doing some form of exercise whether it's low impact yoga or whether it's you know, higher impact exercise cardiovascular exercise weights yeah sure some of it might be a bit tough and and, you, and you, you're putting you through yourself through the paces a little bit but that 30 40 minutes of toughness compared to the the, the non-stop relentless suffering that many people live with and, and that becomes their norm that that's why the message that you're sharing here is, is really important to me because I obviously as a personal trainer and coach see it every day people who, who get in contact with us that they're, they're sort of living with that constant feeling of, of, of poor health and suffering the side effects of disease and and the physical limitations as well so it's and it is a hard mindset shift to if you could give someone that in a tablet form and say, there you go, you know, you, you can now see the light and, and it really is worth it. Um, but it, but it's, it's all about momentum, isn't it, I guess? It, it totally is about momentum and consistency. Um, you, you know, I started doing yoga back then too and kind of fell into it. And over the years, I started doing more yoga, went to, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you've heard of Bikram yoga, went to yeah. Bikram yoga's teacher training. I'd gone to a couple of others as well, but went to his, I was one of the first hundred Bikram teachers. And I didn't go to become a teacher. I went to heal my body to feel better. Mm. And the biggest lesson, and I think this is all part of our mindset discussion, wasn't how to do a better triangle or how to do a better bow pose or any of that stuff. You know, it wasn't the technique aspect of what I was doing. That's not the lesson I learned. Mm. The lesson I learned came from Bikram where he said, don't worry about it, forget about it, just do the yoga. Well, you can apply that to anything. You can yeah. apply that to lifting in a gym. Don't worry about it, forget about it, just you know, do your, your thing, you know, do your routine for the next 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And yeah, because until you try, and exactly. And, and, and yeah, you, you might find that, you know, the results aren't moving as fast as you can, but then, then you do what many people do and you'll, you'll get some help and you get some advice. You'll maybe seek a coach and, but it's, it's that initial getting the ball rolling that is, it really is sort of, you hear it all the time but it is the hardest part right yeah ab absolutely and it's it's that consistency and um you know I've, I've heard somebody else you know what ages us is not moving our joints right because we get arthritis and everything in our joints and our fingers and our hands and we can't move but if we keep moving that onset tends to get delayed so so you went through this um, and then after you got help, you start, I, I guess, did that really for you, was that when the ball really started to roll in terms of moving you out of ill health into thinking and living a more positive, healthier life? Oh, yeah. And that, that experience in, at the Pritikin Center, I mean, changed everything because I went from not being able to do anything to being able to do anything I want, you know, and like I mentioned, you know, I go to the top of a ridge or a butte once a week. And part of that is just gratitude that I can still walk up and down a mountain, right? Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of simplicity in that. There's a lot of simplicity in just being close to nature. And I'm not normally on trails. 
maybe 80% of the time I'm off trail, 20% on trail, because I just like to just go through the woods, mm. you know, and I've gotten pretty good about, at uh, knowing where I am and such in the woods. But um, just that feeling, just being with the trees, just being with the ground, you know, it's just like getting away from my phone and the computers and Zoom calls and, you know, all that busyness that, that we do in our everyday life. It's just like going back to, it's almost, it's all real world. I'll, I'll call nature the natural world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so after this, but, you know, is this when your interest in what you're currently doing today and, and the idea of, 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 well, essentially what your book name is, Falling Down, Getting Back Up Again, is this, how, how soon after you, you, you sort of made that progress did this all come about? Well, pretty much my whole life I've been more of an entrepreneur. I've been a coach, a trainer a consultant in some way, shape, or form for 30 plus years. And I've always enjoyed doing that. I've always enjoyed coaching and training and, and teaching. One of the things that I realized is that I was actually pretty good at helping people get on stage and recognize that they already had the skills to do that, but they didn't recognize it. Again, this comes back to recognizing what we already have and learning how to use it. At, at least in the States, and I assume it's similar where, where, where you live, Matt, and for the, for the listeners, but normally first, second, third grade, there's show and tell. You know, yeah, we come yeah. in, you know, the teacher goes, yeah. hey, Michael, what do you want to talk about today? And you get up in front of the room and you're speaking to mm. 20, 30 people, however many kids, other kids are in the class. So you're already learning the skills of public speaking. Now, the teacher doesn't say, hey, Michael, get up in the room. We're going to practice your public speaking. <laughs> they just say, get up and tell us about the rock that you found yesterday yeah. or what, whatever it might be, whatever subject matter it is. And so when I help people today, I remind them that they already have done that before. They've already done public speaking. They've already stood in front of a group of peers telling a story yeah. and it's just like taking that experience that they had and building on it you know so most people have done that mm. you know the other thing i recognized that i was really good at was um it's almost a quantum leap idea shifting from one side to another and i'll just give you a brief example there is a gentleman in 19 i don't remember 20, 2008, 2008, I think it was, I was running a training in Acapulco. We had about 350 people there for nine weeks, really intense training, right? And this guy was a forensic psychiatrist from the federal prison system. He did a lot of work with high profile um, convicts that were never going to get out of prison that had done something pretty, you know, horrible, right. Yeah. right? So he was getting into all these people's heads, you know, and I had met him a couple of years earlier at a at another workshop that I was doing in Durham, North Carolina, where he was the quiet guy in the back of the room, right? Just like doing a little bit of yoga. And so yeah. he came to our training and I was shocked that he was there, but he was there and he got up and he couldn't talk in front of the group. And so we, we, I broke down this process with them about what he did in the prison, talking in front of groups, all of this stuff, right? So he shifted from this place. I mean, it was an instant shift and you could see the light bulb going off in his head, right? He went from this like scared, withdrawn, quiet psychiatrist, you know, because he had also been injured several times in prison by the prisoners um, to instantly being able to give this talk in this room in, in Acapulco in front of this group and it shifted everything about him like the next day instead of sitting off in the corner eating by himself at mealtime he had a group of 10 people around him talking to him yeah so just just that mindset shift that 
he didn't think he could do it, but he already had the skills to do what we were doing at the time. And do you think some of that is just because he's tapping into um, something that he's very passionate about and uh, that's a strong value to him? Well, I, I definitely think that that is a huge component of it, that he wanted to do it, but he didn't know how to do it. He didn't think he had the skills to do yeah. it, but he already had the skills to do it. So he's just surprised himself. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and I guess that's the important thing about taking that, you know, the, the I guess a lot of what we're talking about here is having the courage. Cour courage is huge, isn't it? Because having the courage just to take that first step, you know, for you when you had that choice between the, one doctor saying to, to sit down and one doctor saying to walk, you know, takes courage just to say okay well i'm gonna choose maybe the harder option because let's face it between rest and, and work and or walking that's that's the bigger option so yeah. that that's a good that's a massive lesson in itself isn't it just sometimes yeah. just plucking up a little bit of courage just to take the harder option and if it doesn't quite work out then what you know generally the worst that can happen isn't going to happen Right. And the worst that can happen isn't that bad, actually. That, that, that's probably one of the big things. I, I don't know if there's something you talk about much, but uh, I know it's a Richard Branson quote. Is, is, you know, he always, every decision he makes, he always look, looks at what the biggest downside is first. And yeah. quite often, more often than not, the things that we worry about the most are the things that are probably going to give us the most growth but yeah. we don't always take action of them because we think of all the things that are going to get in the way. And, but when we think about, well, what is the worst case scenario? It's generally not that bad. Yeah. Yeah. It rarely happens. And you, you, you know, to get to that point of courage, Matt, for me, what, what I found is that for so long, my self-esteem was blocking me. My low self-esteem was blocking me. I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel worth it. And, it's interesting because it's not like I felt worth it before I got the courage. The courage gave me more self-esteem to where I could then feel better. Right. Yeah. So by taking that step, by walking up and down that boardwalk, by going into a gym and lifting, you know, by doing that action gave me the courage and built my self-esteem. So then I could do more actions. Yeah. You know, yeah. I feel better about my whole life. Yeah. With, with the, this, I'm, I'm really like the quantum leap idea is something I'm, I'm really sort of thinking a lot about and particularly the state change. Um, I always remember watching Tony Robbins Netflix documentary. Have you seen it? Yeah. What, yeah. One of the, mo the thing that stood out the most for me was his pre-stage routine. Uh-huh. You know, you, you know it, right? So he does yep. like cold, cold plunge. He does, he's got this whole system that he does. He does, he jumps on a tramp, like a, one of these trampettes for like 15, 30 minutes to get his energy up. He does uh -huh. some breath work and, and he is doing it to get into a different state change. He, yep. you know, and, he, and he talks about why that's so important. He can't go on that stage and deliver the performance that he delivers and that you know he's well known for delivering without being a, a different person to who he naturally is you know his, his natural state and i i got a lot out of that i thought i thought that was really it made me look at things differently it made me think about if you're struggling and you're worried and you and you're needing that courage to do something it's your like you say the courage is within you it really is the quantum leap is getting into the state of mind that's going to allow you to actually, for, for him, it's about creating energy because he's doing these crazy long hours of, of coaching, which, yep. you know, most normal people could never do. Yep. Um, but he's understood and he's learned his body uh, or understood his body enough to know what creates the state change in him to allow him to have that endurance a bit like an athlete will you know have their nutrition and everything and their preparation you know we, everyday people don't sort of think on those terms so much and 
And I think that's a mistake because it's worth noting that you can change it. You know, if you're in the corporate world and you've got to go and deliver a sales presentation or you've got to get up in, in front of the board of directors and, and, you know, pitch whatever you've got to pitch, you, you, this stuff can really help you. Oh, it, it's huge. And, you know, going back to Tony for a minute, you know, you mentioned about him jumping up and down before he gets on stage. That's not complicated. No. Right? But it creates a change of state. It changes the biochemistry of his body and clears his mind. Mm. Just from jumping up and down. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not complicated. You know, and, and Richard Branson's the same way. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of professional athletes, especially out of when I was teaching in L.A. a lot, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, you know, a whole bunch of, of other people. And like Kareem, one of the most important things that he did was his mindset. And he practiced a lot of yoga, which kept him in the NBA for years. But it was the mindset. It was clearing the mind so you can perform. You know, mm -hmm. so if, I, if I'm, I'm much earlier than you are, we're in a different time zone. So I could have just like crawled out of bed and like made my way to this chair and had this discussion. Or I could get up and take a walk for a half an hour up down on the river trail, get yeah. my energy built up and come home and be ready for this podcast. So what state do I want to present in? Yeah, I think it's huge. I think. I think that, yeah, this is a really good topic, and I guess I, I feel like maybe entrepreneurs think think in states and energy more um, because they maybe have a bit more autonomy of their own time. But I, I may be wrong. Um, I certainly certainly do think about my own sort of state and and look like yourself. I'll look at my diary and look at how am I going to manage my energy towards. I've got that there, and, and I need to be really on it for there. I'm going to be training at this time, so. It's one of those things that you, a bit like everything, you, you want to be planning ahead a little bit. You want to be looking and, and being intentional about how you're using your energy from day to day. Yeah. And if, if I can give the listeners something really simple to do, if they, they want to try to do this. And uh, my friend Dina Proctor came up with, with this idea. And it's not complicated. But it's mindset. But it's taking three minutes, three minutes, three times a day meditation is called three by three meditation. So you get up and you sit for three minutes. You don't even have to think about anything, right? Midday, you do the same thing, three minutes. It's a huge shift midday because normally by midday, our mind is all filled with a bunch of junk, you know, yeah. from yeah, what's yeah. going on the last six or eight or nine hours. Yeah. So three minutes, in the middle of the day, and then three minutes in the evening. And that's it. Wow. And I it's just that. like, just shift it, you know, just enough. It's, you know, a 1% shift is huge. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's just so easy to get caught up in the busyness of life and, and we all do it. Um, but that, that that's such a simple little strategy that can help you just bite that in the bud. Yeah, you, you, I, you don't have to necessarily sit for hours. I mean, if you want to, you can. Yeah. I normally don't, but... Um, I like the idea, though, of just pausing. Again, you can just pause quietly for three minutes. Going back to the quantum leaps again, are there any specific... Uh, we talked about state change just then, and we talked about Tony doing his jumping up and down and his cold <laughs> plunges. Are there any sort of things that you, um, you coach or you like to do yourself to help you get into that state change? Obviously, you talked about you know, your, your hiking and walking. That's huge for me, walking and hiking and getting in the woods. And part of the reason I live where I live is easy access to all that, to, to getting mm -hmm. outside and, and getting it in nature. So for me, that really helps. I, you know, if you walk for 20 minutes, you've taken about 2000 steps. You've walked about a mile in, in about 20 minutes, right? Yeah. So right there that's a simple change of state I'll, I'll do two three four walks a day sometimes like between things like i have a mastermind today i've got a coach of one of my clients today i've got a meeting with one of my partners today i'm going to go do yoga later um, and then i'm going to take care of a five-year-old girl 
So in between there, I'm doing lots of other little movement type things. Mm. You know? And I think that that's really important, but it's all based on simplicity, as simple as possible. Yeah. Is that one of the core principles you live by? Well, I like to think that I do. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> that's a good question because the contradiction to that is getting too busy sometimes. Because mm. I can get really busy. And I, I was looking at my calendar a couple of days ago for July. And like, I'm totally booked in July. You know, I don't have a 30 minute slot anywhere. I right? just book. And it's just like, okay, I'm a little over scheduled. How can I unschedule some of this? How can yeah. I just, you know, get rid of it? And I'm still say no to a lot of things, even though I say yes, but I also say no. So I think learning to say no will change your state a lot too. <laughs> yeah, that's the ironic thing, isn't it? About, yeah. you know, I, I guess you, you could sort of summarize what we're talking about is, you know, <sighs> I don't know whether it's a, a jazzy word, but being like a high performer and, and trying to, you know, it's, it's all about the balance and getting that balance between order and chaos constantly. And that's what life tends to be is just that sometimes the chaos becomes a little bit more and then you pull it back and you get more order back in. And then sometimes you're too orderly. You're not really moving forward and you're being a bit more in the comfort zone. And it's, you know, that's where the, the mindset comes in of, of, having that self-awareness to know, okay, well, I need to get, get moving again. I'm getting a little bit more too comfortable. Maybe yeah. um, I'm not pushing it enough. I'm not pushing myself out of that comfort zone. It's, it's, it's a constant effort. Do you have any strategies to help you stay on track and, and not get, get life too busy, too chaotic? Obviously you just shared it's, it's a struggle like any entrepreneur. We all have, we all have it because you know, I guess particularly with entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs listening, you know, you, you, it's all down to you. It's your responsibility to create your future, your, your paycheck it, next month is going to be down to you, what you build in your business. So yeah. there's always going to be that kind of inner, that extra inner sort of move to work a little bit harder and work a, an extra hour. And let's face it, we can particularly work, you know, most entrepreneurs love what they do. And, you know, we, we, just before we started the episode, we both admitted that we, we really enjoy the podcasting and, and making connections. So it's easy to work more hours as well when you love what you do, because it's not really work. Right. Um, but it, I guess it's just getting that balance point between that, you know, family and your relationships and your health and your wellness and eating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, there's a definite ebb and flow to all of that, you know, and there's the ebb and flow of our schedule. And um, I don't know if, you know, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, it was the 15th anniversary of the iPhone coming out. And, really? you know, they're talking about it being one of the most significant changes in human history, you know, being able to do this. It's built Facebook because of iPhone. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's so many different things have come around as a result of that. Yet at the same time, I love putting my iPhone down. Oh, yeah. You, 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 you know, Oh, my favorite, my favorite mode on the iPhone. My favorite <laughs> feature is the airplane mode. That's the best yeah. feature that they created. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I do that, too. And, and I do carry my phone in the woods sometimes, depending upon where I am, I'll turn my GPS on. Um, if I'm not real familiar with the area that I'm in. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's useful in, in that sense too. And at the same time, I mean, we've got our schedule on, we got our bank stuff on, we got our Facebook on, we got our Twitter on, what, whatever all these different things are, yeah. we're taking that with us everywhere we go yeah yeah so yeah we, you know, we have a habit of lpt you know we have a, a scorecard system for what we call the lifestyle performance and you know one of them is decompression and having having a decompression habit that you stick to so whether it's the three by three that you spoke about or whether it's a sleep habit to help you maximize your sleep or whether it's something like that it's you know i think 
having just one decompression habit that you really are rigid with, just like, you know, people like myself are rigid with an exercise habit or a movement habit and a nutrition habit. It's, it, it's, I, I've definitely noticed from coaching many people and for trying to implement myself, it's probably the habit that doesn't get implemented enough because we're so wired in and it's so, let's face it, but we have to admit it's, it is so addictive because we, we want to connect and it has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. We just have that self-awareness to know when it's becoming too much. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, just one decompression habit as i heard you you call it can change everything just one yeah just going to the gym three times a week just going for a walk three times a week just sitting three by three meditation i mean there's all sorts and just one of those things changing the food you know not eating as many potato chips you know eating more carrots i don't i mean just that one change yeah huge and I've actually done that a few years ago. I go, God, I'm eating a lot of chips. And I stopped eating chips within 24 hours. I felt the difference. Literally. Oh, it is, it is huge. Do, yeah. do you know uh, Dan Sullivan from the Strategic Coach? Of, of course, yeah. Yeah, so he's, 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 he uses the term multiplier quite a bit um, in the business sense. And I sort of stole that a little bit in terms of the, the fitness sense. I realized most people are only one to two habits away from a multiple. So we call it the habit multiplier, you know, yeah. and one of the things that we try and do in the coaching is find that one habit. What is the first domino? You know, for some people, it can be just one sleep habit because that one habit, you know, they get a good night's sleep and suddenly their glucose levels aren't completely depleted. They're not craving the sugars and the caffeine and the stimulants that they would normally need which means that, you know, that they've got more energy, that they, they're more likely to go to the gym rather than say, oh, I'm tired, I haven't got enough energy today. And then because they went to the gym, they have more energy and then they feel good about themselves. And then because they work so hard at the gym, they sleep better the next night. Yeah. And it's just this multiplying effect. And because yeah. they're starting to exercise more, they start to make better decisions with their food. And it's just like, wow, you know, I haven't found that, that one habit and it's just multiplied my life. And I think there's so many people that are just one habit away from doing that. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I know a couple of doctors here locally that before they do any other type of treatment, they make sure that the person's sleep is in order. And if it's not in order, they say, go do this for the next couple of weeks, make another appointment and come back. Wow. And oftentimes, that's a good when, <laughs> yeah, oftentimes when they come back, that malady has um, not affected them as much. It's starting to go away. So the doctor doesn't have to give them other treatment. Just by getting that one habit, your sleep habit in order. Yeah, sleep it is, it is, a, is absolutely crucial. Um, and, 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 and it's good that in recent years that the science is really coming out now to, to, to prove it. Right. So um, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Michael. Any last words of wisdom for people that are trying to make positive changes in their life? They're trying to make quantum leap, leaps, maybe. And um, yeah, any last words of wisdom for them, to help them do that? Well, I, I think one of them was just touched on is what I heard you say is that one habit and you know, that multiplier is find one thing that maybe you can do differently, you know, in the next 30 days or not even the next 30 days, I'm going to challenge anybody that's listening is to find one thing you can change in the next 48 hours mm, and yeah. see how it affects you, whether it's going for a walk, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's eating more carrots and less chips, whether it's, you know, changing your sleep. Just choose one thing. Don't choose six. Choose yeah, one. And it sounds easy. It's not because no. the chances are you you probably know what that habit is, and and because you know what that habit is, you know it's going to stretch you. And to do it for thirty days certainly going to stretch you. So even though it's only one habit, it's not easy. Right. Yeah. But, but it's yet yet it's simple. But but yeah, and exactly. But also because you kind of think it, it sounds too easy. And then when you 
tick it off. Like I use a self journal and I, I really like the self journal because you can, you can write down a habit and you can just tick off the box each day or you can just leave it blank, or whatever. And, you know, it's good to do that because you see, you just see your trends and you see how many days out of the month did I not manage to do that habit. And yeah. then you can look back at it and go, oh, it wasn't so easy. <laughs> Why wasn't it so easy? And then you can explore that and, and look at how maybe next month we could get a full 100% streak instead. Yeah, yeah. Or they, they, you know, they might go, well, that was easier than I thought. Exactly, yeah. And then they feel fulfilled and they're sort of, they feel good about themselves so they can choose the next habit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael, where can people find more out about you and, and your book? Uh, best place to go is just go to my website, Michael B, as in boy, michaelbharris.com, really easy. And, you, and if anybody's interested in finding out more about speaking or talking or telling your story, um, there's, you can opt in there. There's a whole bunch of free resources and videos, how to overcome nervousness, how to write a, um, a story, to a talk for stage. There's all sorts of different free materials, free resources there. Um, the other thing that they could do and this, there is no link directly on my website for this, but it says Michael B. Harris forward slash book. So if they're interested in my book, they can download it for free right there, or they can buy it from any bookseller around the world, really, anywhere. Fantastic. Well, we'll put the link of that in the show notes anyway. Um, the last question I always ask is, obviously, the name of this podcast is Mastering Use. What does self-mastery mean to you in one sentence? Self-mastery to me means making a decision to live in peace more of the time. I love it. Great way to end. Michael Harris, thanks for your time. Thank you.